the origin of the Egyptian mystery mysteries. on party people in the place to be i go by the name of the bk apologies transmitting all the way live new york is the city brooklyn is the borough what's good what's popping uh happy uh bodega eve to everyone um quick plug tomorrow is a, a a huge bodega for us we're doing the halloween special you don't want to miss that we're gonna have the crew come and share our thoughts about this uh this alleged pagan holiday so we're going to talk about that. But um, as always, we want to talk about the party people in the chat, which is right now, just be new. <laughs> oh, that's what I see so far. And we got CMB in the check-in. What's going on, y'all? What's going on? Yes, yeah, Rocks B's in the building. Okay, okay, they're coming in, they're coming in. All right, all right. And as always, if you have not already, please like, share, and subscribe. You know, tell a friend to tell a friend that's him again. Also, if you'd like to support this online ministry, you can donate at my PayPal. Or if you'd like to be a monthly supporter, you could become a patron. We get an assortment of uh, teaching aids for your personal Bible study. So we got ECs in the building. We got Richly Redeemed. We got Bodega Lady Michelle Turner. Okay, okay. That's what I'm talking about. We got RNO. What's up? What's up? So I have with me for this evening's violence. Um, one of the young gunners of the UA, one of the sharpest dudes I know, those books, that's not green screen. Those are actual books behind him, and he's read all of them twice. So, um, <laughs> of course, I'm talking about no other than my man, MJ Jackson. What's going on, sir? What's going on, uh, BK? Uh, the chat, how y'all doing? I see them, they're just dropping in. Yeah, man. Homecoming. What's up, y'all? What's up? What's up? We got Black Smurf on the check-in. What's going on, sir? So tonight we will be speaking about the origin of the Egypt Egyptian mystery system. Uh, the reason why we want to talk about that is that for many people in the conscious community, one of the accusations that they throw at us and Christianity is that Christianity itself is, well, two things. The white man's religion and or a ripoff of these ancient comedic mystery systems. I'm sure you've heard these accusations before, MJ. Like, what what do you take, what's your, what's your overall feeling about that indictment towards Christianity? Um, I mean, I, I hear people talk out of both sides of their mouth when they make that um, that indictment. Uh, because what they're really trying to get you to see is that, hey, uh, it's not true. You can believe it anyway, but it's still, you know, it's still a ripoff. But you can still believe it anyway because it's not true. Uh, <laughs> right, you, right. You, you know, so I mean, I've, 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 you know, working on the assembly line back at General General Motors, I would hear, you know, people uh, talk that talk after they don't watch them a little bit of uh, hidden colors. And then from Hidden Colors, they then went to the local black bookstore. And 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 back at back at home in Fort Worth, we got we have a very nice black bookstore. I mean, they had Woke Church in there. They had okay. books by Dr. Tony Evans in there. But they also on the other aisle had <laughs> Stolen Legacy, mm. and and they came before Columbus mm. and and some of John G. Jackson's book, uh, Christianity Before Christ, and mm. things like that. We could. Do a whole series right. on, on, on a lot of those books. That's true. And, and those books that you just ran off, the, these are the, the backbone for a lot of the convictions that people have garnered within the conscious community. And, you know, it's it's about time, you know, we start knocking down these sacred cows of theirs, you know, mm -hmm. and show it show them what they're really working with. You know, it's kind of like, you know, those Scooby-Doo mysteries, when they finally capture the so-called ghost and they take off the, the, the mask and it's just some regular dude, right? Yeah. 
That's yeah. what we're going to do today. We're, me and MJ are those meddling kids who are about to take off the mask of the ancient, so-called ancient Egyptian mystery system. So with that being said, let's get cracking. So, all right. This is from The Travels of Cephals, J. McPherson, Canadian Society for 18th Century Studies. And he says, to the early 17th century, the Hermetic writings were believed to originate in Egypt, home of Hermes Tregmagus, as well as a false etymology of alchemy, made it made it the Egyptian art fanciful views of Egyptian learning and religion predominated until the new era in Egyptian studies that was ushered in by Napoleon's Nile expedition of 1798 and its slow scholarly aftermath culminating in the deciphering of the hieroglyphs through the Rosetta Stone. Up to then, European scholars had to depend mainly on the reports of the ancient Greeks, to whom the spoken language of contemporary Egyptians was no less a closed book than that of the inscriptions. So right here, he's talking about how during this time in history, um, they haven't cracked the code yet. They have it deciphered the script that's known as the, the metal netter, the, the hieroglyphics. So any information they had about ancient Egypt had to come from these Greeks, these Greek historians. But the Greek themselves could not decipher the Egyptian text. So I don't know how much information these historians was able to gather if you can't read the primary sources. Now, MJ, you know, as, as a scholar, you know, how important is it for you to be able to not only have uh, primary sources, but able to interpret them properly? I mean, that's big. I mean, um, you know, if we did a comparison to what we have with the uh, Gospels of the first century, um, one, we can pretty much date the Gospels to within a generation. Uh, of uh, the first Christians. Also, you have multiple independent attestation uh, within the church fathers, uh, citing the gospels and things like that. Um, then also you have manuscript evidence. Uh, was, you know, I think the earliest uh, manuscript, maybe in the second century, we may have a first century manuscript. Uh, so uh, this type of you really can't say these these uh, types of things for other quote unquote so called writings from antiquity, uh, and then when you have to rely on um, on another people group to make sure that they're translating <laughs> something correctly or make sure they give you uh, correct information, we already know that that Plutarch distorted a lot of you know a, a lot of egyptian religion you know we already know that and so when you happen to rely on greek sources like plutarch and things like that you're you're in trouble right and, and it gets more interesting so here's another um paper uh the myth of egypt and its hieroglyphics in european tradition by eric iverson the greeks and romans had little knowledge of this writing and could not read it even in antiquity, the signs came to be endowed with mystical and magical properties. This tendency carried on and developed in the Middle Ages became one of the prominent literary and artistic devices of the Renaissance period. Not only that, but having been assimilated into Neoplatonic tradition, the mystical signs and the philosophical properties attached to them became major elements in the tradition of Neoplatonism. So again, they could not read the script. So they started to just spitball properties and definitions. And they endowed it. They gave it mystical and magical properties. Right? So they they, they were just guessing. They were freestyling what these, these characters meant. Right? And this freestyle, this spitballing, became intertwined with Neoplatonic tradition. Right? So it became synonymous with Neoplatonism. So they couldn't really decipher it. They freestyle. They went off the head, and then their freestyle became part of this philosophy of Neoplatonism, right? But for some reason, it became um, at that time that they actually knew what they were reading on the walls, but they did not have a clue. 
Which again, it's not the most scarly thing to do, is it, MJ? No, <laughs> not, not at all. In other words, they were they were interpreting uh, Egyptian religion, Egyptian customs, and things like that according to their culture, right? According to the things that they like, exactly. And uh, you know what what scholarship has shown is just quite the opposite that scholarship has shown that the Egyptians had a lot in common with their African brother and also uh, their other neighbors within the A&E, yeah. such as uh, the worldview uh, of uh, continuity, uh, which is another topic for another day, but you know. Right, right. So let's let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. So um, going back to the, the J. McPherson's paper, he says, reaching its modern form in London in 1717 as a middle class club with no special trade affiliation, Freemasonry then spread vigorously, taking on a variety of social and political colorings and legendary provinces, while the central myth of British Freemasonry concerned the building of Solomon's Temple. This is from the Constitutions of Freemasons by James Anderson. Pretentious Pretentious writers bent on puffing up the prestige of his subject offered numerous hints about other Eastern sources for its tradition. So you have the Freemasonry, this basically this, this secret society as we know it today, started, you know, in the 17th, 18th century, but they wanted to retrofit their, their guild, their society back into even further from antiquity into um, the ancient Near East. Okay. Now, this is a book called Egypt Egyptomania, a history of fascination, obsession, and fantasy by Ronald A. Fritz. And this is what he says. The 18th century welcome works of fiction set in a hermetic or mystic version of ancient Egypt. Abbe Jean Terrasson, a priest and a professor of classical languages at the Collège de France, began his literary trend. In 1731, he brought out a long novel in three volumes titled Cephos, a history or biography based on unpublished memoirs of ancient Egypt. The novel uses the literary device of claiming to be a translation of an old manuscript by a nameless Greek from the second century AD. Terrasson, however, assures his readers that Cephos is fiction. Okay. So this alleged translation of this ancient manuscript, this is a story, it's a novel, it's fiction. But he also claims that it was based on authentic ancient sources. As a result, many people took the novel to be a, re a reliably accurate historical account in a similar way to how Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. So this idea of, you know, based on true events type of vibe didn't start in, in our era. You know, they were doing this even back then. You know, I'm going to make this book as if it's a, a realistic translation of an ancient script, but it's for fun, guys. So keep that in mind. He tells people up front, it's fiction. All right. Uh, the impact of Terrasson's novel on the popular image of Egypt was far greater than the truly scholarly works that were published during the 18th century. Freemasons in France used Cephals as a handbook for creating their own Egyptianized rituals. Mozart's popular magic flute was a collaboration with a mason, Emmanuel Schickander, which <laughs> borrowed elements of its plot and scenes from Cephals. So here's this book by Terrasson where he, he admits it's fiction, but the Freemasons take parts of the book and use it as part of their initiation rituals, all right? So it's not based on facts. These Freemasons are using a fictional account of, of an initiation, and they make it part of their actual initiation. What are your thoughts on that, Mr. Jackson? Well, I mean, I, th I think that uh, something that you pointed out earlier that should be remembered is that the quote unquote Grand Lodge mentioned in his fictional account is supposed to be that pattern after Solomon's Temple? Um, that's important for everybody to remember. That's going to be important later <laughs> as we keep going. But the dude tells you uh, up front this is fiction, uh, but it's also an exercise in, um, 
in Eurocentrism. Mm. And pretty pretty much later, we will see how Eurocentrism gives rise to, uh, you know, to, to another type of centrism <laughs> that, that's trying to combat it. And right. both of them are off. Right. Absolutely. So let's, let's keep it going. Let's, all right, here we go. Terrasson's ancient Egypt is simply an idealized version of 18th century Europe with hermetic emphasis. Such an Egypt met the needs of Terrasson's plot in a way that a true depiction of ancient Egypt could never have done, even if such knowledge had been available in 1731. Despite being a very long and sometimes tedious novel, Cephos was very popular in the 18th century and was translated from French into English and German. It influenced Masonic thinking and rituals at the time, and in the mid-20th century would be used for Afrocentric purposes by George G.M. James. Now, who's George G.M. James? I'm glad you asked. Uh, origins of the modern movement have been credited to the Caribbean writer of African descent, George James from Guyana, who would be described by Martin Bernal and Black Athena as, quote, a pioneer. He was a university teacher in Arkansas when, big up to you, uh, <laughs> MJ, <laughs> uh, where he published in 1954 a book with the ambiguous subtitle, Stolen Legacy. The Greeks were not the authors of Greek philosophy, but the people of North Africa commonly called the Egyptians. That's a long title for a book. James was a career academic, and his book was published in New York by the Innovative Philosophical Library. His emphasis, as with Bernal, was the influence of ancient Egypt on Greek and classical civilization. He described an Egyptian mystery, an Egyptian mystery system as the basis of these beliefs. Now remember, they couldn't read. The source that he quotes from in his book is a fictional novel. I want you to keep that in mind, right? He's trying to make the case that these things came from ancient Egyptian mystery systems. And one of the sources is uh, Terrasome's fictional novel. It's a fictional novel, right? And here's the title of the book. Here's the cover. A lot of us have seen it. If you've been to a black bookstore, you have seen this book. Trust me. Mm -hmm. Trust me. Start a kid. It's, it's pretty much, right? It is everywhere. Up and down 125th Street, all the book vendors, they all have this. It's almost like it's a rule or something. You can't sell books in the street unless you got this one here. You know what I mean? So, so and yes, like I said, one of the sources that he uses to back up his claim is Cephos, volume one, history or life taken from the antidotes of ancient Egypt, all right? Uh, the earliest descriptions of academies for Egyptian priests were large libraries and art galleries. In fact, first, in fact, first occurs not in any ancient text, but in the 18th century French work of historical fiction, the 1732 novel Cephos by Ebo Jean Terrasson. Terrasson's novel was widely read. It, was, it had a profound influence on portrayals of Egyptian religion and later literature, such as Mozart's Magic Flute. So this fictional novel was, was viral back then, so much to the part where Mozart, who also was a Freemason, made this overture called the Magic Flute. You know, the Freemasons incorporated the, the initiation rituals in this fictional account into their actual lodges. So it's very interesting. All these people are, are being inspired by something that is fictional and was admitted to be fiction. In fact, here is, just so you know that I'm not lying, just so you know I'm lying, here's the quote from the book itself. It says, the Greek manuscript of which I have offered the public a translation was found in the library of a foreign nation, extremely jealous of this sort of treasure. The author is nowhere named but we find by several passages in this work that he was a Greek born and lived in Alexandria under the reign of Marcus Aurelius. There is no room to doubt, but this work is a fiction. He says it in the book, guys. So it's not like after deep research, we found out that his sources did not fit. The, no, 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 no. We didn't have, have to do none of that. He was very upfront. This is fiction. This is fiction. So why is Professor George G.M. James, an actual academic, quoting a book 
that clearly states that is a work of fiction to prove his claim that the Greeks and Romans ripped these things from ancient Egyptians when the source he's using is fictional. If you was a professor, MJ, and someone used a fictional novel to back up their claim, would that go well with you in your in your class, sir? Mm, no, no, that, <laughs> that, that wouldn't go well. And, <laughs> and it doesn't stop there. I'm I, If I want to read a little something from this book right here. Sure. This is um, Afrocentrism, Mythical Past and Imagined Homes by Stephen uh -oh. Howe. Uh -oh. So if you join uh, BK Apologist Patreon, he might be able to find that for you. <laughs> uh, but it says uh, on in chapter six on page 66, George Granville Monia James book Stolen Legacy has achieved uh, posthumous fame as a founding text of Afrocentrism and especially of the argument that the ancient Greeks stole all of their knowledge from black Egyptian. James' book, however, is as much uh, mystic, ritualistic, and, for, uh, and more specifically messianic work as it is an Afrocentric one. His major sources include messianic, theosophical, Rosicrucian works. These currents sometimes overlap. For instance, the Theosophist founded uh, the first and only messianic lodges to admit women, lauding the ancient Egyptians as the originators of an esoteric wisdom and ritual, which has passed directly to present day cults and secret societies. Among these sources are C.H. Veils, The Ancient Mysteries and Modern Day uh, Masonry, uh, D. Davidson's The Great Pyramid, Its Divine Message, Annie Besant's Esoteric Christianity, H. Spencer Lewis, Mystical Life of Jesus, and the Rosicrucian Digest. James Central Plea relates not as with most Afro uh, Afro American works in a related vein, mainly uh, the need for racial uplift, but his desire for the solution of the problem uh, of universal unrest. Okay, so uh, basically, this he wrote this book around 1954. Um, you don't have to be a historian to know what was going on in 1954. You got Brown versus the Board of Education, things like that. Segregation is at all time high. You deal it with separate but equal, and you know that's a big old rabbit hole. But uh, George James was trying to uplift uh, black people. He was trying to uplift the spirits of black people. Uh, trying to point to them that their history did not start in slavery. Well, I, I don't know any black person who believes that their history started in slavery. I, I don't I don't know that. Uh, I, I don't know anybody who believes that. But the route that he was taking to uh, to do this, it wasn't scholarly because this man right here knew Greek. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that's the funny part about it. he was a legitimate scholar he knew greek but here he is appealing to um mythomania <laughs> he's going he's he he's he's engaging in mythomania to try to uplift the spirits of black people at a crazy time some would call the second reconstruction so it's crazy Man, good stuff, good stuff. I told you you got them books. Those books are not, you know, for just looks. He reads these things. So um, let's, let's keep going. In 1731, classicist and philosopher Jean Terrasson published his only work of fiction, Sephold's History of Life, from the Monuments and Adults of Ancient Egypt. The novel set two generations before the Trojan War is a biography of the Egyptian prince Sephold that describes his education, his initiation into a secret society of priests his travels through Africa, and his eventual return to Egypt. Although the novel was initially only moderately successful, over the next century, six French editions were published, in addition to seven translations into English, German, Italian, and Russian, suggesting that Sephos had a wide and varied readership. In particular, initiation of Terrasson's hero into the Egyptian priesthood served as the inspiration for Masonic rituals. Again, Fictional novel is the inspiration for the Freemason initiation rituals. It is un, 
understandable that the Masons in the 18th century, when these rituals were established, regarded them as both ancient and Egyptian, since they had no other means of knowing about Egyptian religion than from Greek and Roman sources. And the later European accounts that were based on them, all authentic information about early Egyptian religion was inaccessible to them because the documents that described it could not be read before 1836 when the Rosetta Stone was discovered and hieroglyphics were finally deciphered. So they, like I said earlier in, in, in the video, in this video, we, they could not read the hieroglyphics. All information that they needed to, to build something connected to ancient Egypt was not accessible to them. So they're making it up as they go along. As of right now, they are engaging in Eurocentric cosplay of an a, a, a idea of what ancient Egypt might have been. That's what's happening right now. All right. And this is this is the information that George GM James is using to prove that stuff was 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 ripped off from ancient Egypt. But they don't have any information in ancient Egypt at this point. They're not ripping anything off. They're making stuff up, but they're not ripping anything off. Right. So to continue, it is certainly understandable that um, that Terrasson was unable to distinguish Greek rituals from indigenous Egyptian rituals. He could not read any inscriptions or papyri that describe ancient Egyptian rites and beliefs. Since they were written in Egyptian alphabets, such as hieroglyphics or hieratic script, which no one at the time could read. He's again, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep drawing this point. The book Stolen Le Legacy is using a fictional novel about ancient Egypt from a man who could not read the ancient Egyptian script. Nor could anyone else at the time. And like what MJ said, George G.M. James is not a dummy. He is an academic. He is a professor. He taught at the university level. So why would he do this? He knows better. MJ, your thoughts, please. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to get more into um, uh, the Hermetica um, not too much, but if you want to, you know, feel free. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's deal with with one of the sources that uh, that Terrison um, is appealing to. Okay, and I got another book for everybody. <laughs> this one might cost you a little bit. It's oh, that's called Joint. That's what I need right there. Profane oh. Egyptologist by Paul Harrison. Okay, Doctor Mason turned me on to this book. Okay, um, it says Hermes. Uh, thrice great, a philosopher named for uh, for the Greek version of the Egyptian god Thoth Dehuti, and significant uh, to early Christian authority. The um, people thought that this was, um, you know, said to be Egyptian. Uh, they thought that it, they went back to uh, some, you know. Uh, a, a Egyptian scholar that studied up under Hermes. That's why he got the name. Right. Uh, but it says later on page five, the Hermeticum was later determined to be a work not of ancient Egyptian origin, but likely penned between the first and the third centuries CE after Jesus. After Jesus. Penned <laughs> After Jesus, that's why when you also look at some of uh, the ritual that comes up out of uh, Terrace's work, it talks about you know being dead for three days and things like that. Well, clearly we can kind of see of uh, some borrowing. <laughs> we can kind of we can kind of see uh, some some interaction with uh, with the Christian religion, and and they wouldn't be the only one. A lot of uh, uh, cults. A lot of the quote unquote mystery cults. And once again, for um for to, to say that the Egyptians had a mystery um religion, that's kind of a misnomer. We know that the Greeks had mystery religions, uh, with Dionysus and and others and things like that. We know that they did. 
Um, but the Egyptians, that was specifically not uh, that was specifically for the priesthood. It wasn't for lay people. It was not for lay people. Right. So that's a bit of a misnomer. But they said that that the, that this was determined to be uh, to be a Greek work penned um, between the first and the third century. Hermet Hermeticism, however, endured in forms of Freemasonry, which further uh, mythologized the nature of Egyptian culture. And like I said, more could be said. But even that source uh, is, is being used in an anachronistic fashion. <laughs> so this thing has more holes than Swiss cheese. And that's just the problem when, you know, that's the, that's the problem when you're being dogmatic <laughs> about these type of things. But the stuff that you're being dogmatic about says that it's fiction. Now I can be dogmatic about the Gospel of Luke and things like that because what is what does Luke say right at the beginning? So I interview people. <laughs> <laughs> I did my research. He said, "I did." He said, "I did my research." What does John in the Gospel of John say at the end? These things are written so that you may believe and have life in His name. Things like that, and then you know, we we have uh, extra biblical attestation that. Mark wrote down the memoirs of Peter and things like that. Matthew wrote Matthew. I mean, you just don't get this type of stuff. Uh, and it's just embarrassing. It really is. And, and it gets worse. It, it gets, gets worse. worse. Yep. All right. So it wouldn't be unreasonable to suppose that the Masons, who do not pretend to be serious scholars, would have sought to revise their rituals and notions of their own history in the light of new information about Egypt that became available after hieroglyphics could be read. If James had intended to write a serious academic book rather than a myth history, he would have taken recent discoveries about Egypt into consideration. Now, you said, um, MJ, that he wrote this around the, the 1950s, yes? Mm-hmm. By this time, the pyramid text was deciphered, the coffin text was deciphered, the, the Perep M. Heru, the coming forth by day, what we know better as the, the Book of the Dead, was the site. All these things, the primaries, the things that you would need to really have a, a some sort of understanding of the Egyptian spiritual systems were already available by the 50s. He never had to use a fictional novel. It wasn't like back in, the, in, in those days where they had nothing but spitballing Greek historians. <laughs> He actually had the primaries translated. So this was, he made this decision to do this. I, and I guess he thought nobody was going to look at it. And what's interesting here, what you see here when the hieroglyphics became deciphered, there was a split when it came to those who studied um, Egypt. <clears throat> you had this thing called Egypt, Egypt Sophie, refers to the study of an imaginary Egypt viewed as the profound source of all esoteric lore and reflects the idea prevalent since antiquity that the ancient Egyptians were a race of mysterious sages. The academic discipline of Egyptology splits from Egyptsophy in 1822 when Jean-Francois Chapollion decipherment of the Egyptian hieroglyphics. So when the academics finally got a hold of these primaries, and thanks to um, Champollion, the Rosetta Stone, were able to translate it. They were like, oh, all this stuff that we were spitballing and freestyling, we don't got to do that anymore. Because we actually know what it says. And guess what? We were wrong. So we're going to let this stuff go. But there were still people. Well, actually, before I say that, I'm jumping the gun. Let me show you this. Once texts by the ancient Egyptians themselves were, were able to be read, the centuries-long belief in a mystical Egypt was revealed to be inaccurate. We said again, the centuries long belief in a mystical Egypt was revealed to be inaccurate. The fantasy image of, of Egypt continued, however, in a parallel tradition alongside the scholarly one. So you have the Greco Romans spitballing, just making stuff up, putting mystical, you know, connotations into characters that they could not read until the 18th century, where now it was deciphered and there was a split. You have the Egyptologists 
who were academic and scholarly and went with, with, with actual data, but you still had the people who still held on to mystical Egypt. And they were the e Egypt Sophie. You had parallel tracks. You had the academic scholarly investigators of ancient Egypt, and you had the Eurocentric cosplayers of ancient Egypt. So there was a split. Guess which camp John Jim James is rocking with? <laughs> He's rocking with the cosplayers. He's rocking with the cosplayers. And, and again, here's another source. This is the Handbook of Freemasonry by uh, Henrik Bulgen, John A. Schnook. This is from Brill Academic Publishers. This route of trials clearly derived from Ebbe Jean Tedesong's prolix novel, Cephos, a work which rapidly became identified with Egyptian mysteries. So within the handbook, if the history, like, they don't hide this. The Freemasons don't hide this. Our rituals, our initiation, our sacred science comes from Egypt, Sophie. It comes from a mystical idea of Egypt that never existed. And this is the camp that George G.M. James is, seems to be rocking with. MJ, please, your thoughts. <laughs> Once again, like you just said, it gets worse. <laughs> uh, and, you know, like I said, if, if, if you're going to talk about the greatness of uh, black people and uh, not only coming from uh, wonderful traditions in Africa, but even rising above slavery, how do you follow it up with something like this? Once again, this is about as bad as a book that we critiqued that came out in April. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder what book that is, anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, you know what? It's sad, but the parallels are there. Mm -hmm. the parallels are there, which is very sad. So, you it's know, that's you got no history. Yeah. You got no history because you'll be doomed to repeat it as that individual did. So, all right. So, another source that GM James uses to prove his claim that these things were ripped off from ancient Egyptian mystery system. And it's a book that you actually quoted earlier, MJ. It's The Ancient Mysteries of Modern Masonry by Reverend C.H. Val. So let's see what he had to say. The learned Greek Plutarch. Uh-oh. Oh, there he is. We're already, we're already bad, right? We're already going bad here. Mm. Himself an initiate into the Osirica, of which was probably a theosis at Delphi, gives much valuable information regarding the mysteries of Egypt. Of course, he can only give hints. So I don't know how valuable his information is if he's just giving you hints. For as he says, in speaking of the priests, their philosophy, which for the most part was hidden in myths and words, containing dim reflections and transparencies of truth, as doubtless they themselves make indirectly plain by fitly setting sphinxes up before the temples, as though their reasoning about the gods possess a wisdom wrapped in the riddle so great then was the care Egyptians took about the wisdom which concerned the mysteries of the gods in other words Plutarch is like I don't know what to make of this stuff that's what he's saying here <laughs> he's saying it in very flowery language but he's like yo these dudes kept their information to themselves nobody's telling me anything I'm trying to figure things out I don't know I don't know that's what he's saying here yet he's a self-styled comedic priest, but he can't read the metal meta. And at best, he can only give hints. Again, this is another source that George G.M. James is using to back up his claim. But here, the claim says, I, we don't know much. All right, let's keep going um, in, in this book, Ancient Mysteries and Modern Masonry. And the most wise, the Greeks also are witness. Uh, Solon, Thales, Plato, Exaltius, Paracrius, and as some say, Lycurgus, as well as though coming to Egypt and associating with her priests, and brought back to the memory of his men their symbolic and mysterious art containing their dogmas and dark sayings. When, therefore, thou nearest the myth sayings of the Egyptians concerning the gods, wanderings, and dismemberings, and many such passages, thou shouldn't remember that what has been said above and think none of these things spoken as they really are in state and action. Again, there's Plutarch. What is he saying? Listen, even the stuff that we do know, you know, take it with a grain of salt because we, we don't really know, fam. <laughs> That's what he's saying. <laughs> you know, and he's the high priest. 
he's the guy that people come to to find out about the Egyptian mystery um, systems. And he's like, yeah, you know, this, that, and the other. That's about it. You know, he doesn't make for a compelling witness, does he, MJ? Once again, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, they, they're going to say, why y'all, this is so bad that one of the, I'm, I'm telling y'all, put some money on it that you're going to see this uh, this type of comment in the comment section. Why are y'all messing with that man? He dead. That's the type. That's the type of responses that you're gonna hear to this nonsense. He, he was doing the best he could. No, he did it. He knew better. I'm. He I'm knew better. We'll stop making videos about this type of stuff when people stop selling their books and reprinting them and using this against us. Yes. Because <laughs> this okay. Yeah. Hey, we love truth, man. And truth, it, truth is is neither black nor white, nor African. It's not relative. No, truth is objective, and that's what we're that's what we after. And I'm sorry that 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 uh George Granville Monia Jan's got to take this AL tonight, but yeah, he's gonna have to take it because this is embarrassing. And, and the embarrassment continues because in the book that he cites as a source, cites this individual. Well, first it cites Plutarch. Plutarch can only give you hints. He's still trying to figure it out. He doesn't know really much. But then this book also cites. Epiphanus, as an outsider, could not be expected to understand the rites he describes. Let that marinate for a minute. As an outsider, could not be expected to understand the rites he is describing. <clears throat> okay, and as and as a narrow bigot, so now he's racist too. He could not be expected to deal with them fairly. But the importance of the passage is the testimony it bears to the fact that one of the most widespread mystic festivals was connected with a, quote, rite of resurrection. That's a familiar term, huh? Mm -hmm. You notice here the, the crowing of the cock, which is connected with the crucifixion of Jesus. Somebody been reading the Bible. And the cross marked on the forehead hands and knees or feet of the image or the one who has returned from the underworld. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen in the chat. None of this is found in the primary sources. This rite of resurrection, the crucifixion of Jesus is not in ancient Egypt. No, you ain't coming back home. That's it. You're not coming back. Because <laughs> remember, they're making it up. So they're, they're, they're wedging things in the spaces of the places of which they don't know what to put. So what do they know? The Bible. So their secret initiations involves a lot of Christian needs. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Other ceremonies of the Egyptian mysteries are of interest. At one stage of his advancement, the candidate laid himself upon a curiously hollowed wooden cross and after certain ceremonies was entranced. His body was then carried down into the vaults underneath the temple or pyramid while he himself descended into Hades or the underworld. That is to say, in our modern nomenclature, he passed on to the astral plane. Man, this sounds awfully familiar. Here, he had many experiences. Part of his work being to preach to the spirits in prison. Oh, my ding, God. Ding, ding, ding. What does that sound like, ladies and gentlemen? For he remained in the trans condition, wait for it, three days and three <laughs> nights. Dude, should we get the organ out for this? <laughs> three days and three <laughs> nights. Hallelujah. <laughs> Which typified the three rounds and the intervals between them during which man has gone through the earlier part of his evolution and descending into matter. They don't know the hieroglyphics. They can't describe the rituals that they're trying to. They can't tell you what the, the rituals they're describing is. They can't do any of that. So <laughs> what they do, they fall back on what they do know. Preaching to the spirits in prison. Three days and three nights. Who's borrowing from whom, MJ? 
Um, clearly, they clearly, clear, clearly, they're borrowing from the Christian tradition that's already been going for almost two hundred years at this point. Um, this is a shame. Y'all don't the jig is up. Y'all don't have to be so secretive up in them lodges with all them dudes. <laughs> yeah, the jig is up. You're all a bunch of bootleg Christians. You just don't, you know. You, tell, come on home. Yeah, come on home. What what does scripture say? Having a form of godliness. Godliness, but denying its power. Mm -hmm. That's what we're seeing here in, in the fraudulent Egyptian mystery systems here. Right? Um like I said, Ronald Nash wrote a book, uh, The Gospel and the Greeks, uh, and he documents how these mystery religions borrowed from Christianity. He, he documents this. So if y'all ever want to read up on this, uh, because, you know, the the mythicists of the world accuse us of borrowing uh, when it's just the reverse. It's, right. it's just the reverse. And, and more borrowing right here. Check this out. Check this out. So, this is part of, of the initiation in Freemasonry here. Okay, this is the ancient Egyptian mystery. Ooh, right. Then, after three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, on the morning of the fourth day, he rose again from the dead. That is, his body was brought back from the vault and so placed that the rays of the rising sun fell upon his face. And he awoke. This symbolizes the awakening of man in the fourth round, the commencement of his ascent out of matter on the upward arc of evolution. Mm. You can't find none of this in any of the primary sources in ancient Kemet. This is, again, Eurocentric cosplay of a <coughs> mystical Egypt that never existed. Okay, and again, this is one of his sources to prove that the Greco-Roman world stole from the ancient Egyptians. No, you're stealing from us. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what you're stealing. All right, let's keep going. Oh, this, this, this is gonna hurt a lot of feelings. All right, so let me, let me set this up right. Okay, so we're still in the same book, right? You see, <laughs> the mysteries of modern masonry. The Egyptian mysteries had three grades called mortals, intelligences, and creators of light. The mortals were probationary pupils who were instructed in the doctrine, but who had not yet realized the inner vision. Then you have the intelligences, were those who had attained the inner vision and had become men and received mind. Then you have the creators of, or sons of light. Who were, were those who had become one with the light and had attained true spiritual consciousness. All right? Remember, you got the mortals, you got the intelligences, you got the creators of or sons of light. Remember that this is stuff that they're making up because they can't read the hieroglyphics or the hieratic script, and they're infusing what their imaginations with Christian needs. Right. Remember, this is what's happening here in this book. Why am I hopping on you to remember, remember this? Because. All right, hold up. Give me a second. All righty. Boom, 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 boom. One, two, one, two. OK. The reason why I'm, I want you to focus on that. Once again, right, you got the model, the intelligences, the creators, or sons of light. Because there's a video of a lecture by Aswa Quasi. All right, he's considered probably one of the more modern godfathers of what we're calling now the conscious community. You know, before the polites and the, the dude with the ponytail, what's his name again? Um, I'm not trying to be funny, I actually just forgot his name. You're talking about Booker, Booker. No. Well, him and, and, and um, the guy that was beefing with me. What's his name again? Shaka. Oh, Before Shaka. Was Shaka. <laughs> I forgot about that. Dude. You're talking um, about the Valentine's. <laughs> Molly, Molly, you know, joking. But here's a lecture. In fact, um, 
Sonetta, before he, there was such a thing as YouTube, he was also a street vendor of books and DVDs, and he would sell bootleg lectures of Ajwa Kwesi. And here's a lecture from Ajwa Kwesi called The Craft of Amun Ra African Mystery System. And lo and behold, what's the screenshot? Which book he has behind him in the screen? Stolen Legacy. Right? And look what he's quoting. Grades of students in the mystery system. The mortals, the intelligences, traitors of sun or light. It's pretty much a word for word quote of the book that we're reading right now. A book, mind you, that readily admits <laughs> we can't read the metal net. We can't read the hieratic script. This uh, Plutarch doesn't know what's going on here. Uh, Epiphysis. He's a bigot, and he can't describe what he's what he's he's telling you. <laughs> but I, I swear, crazy, who's teaching people that this is a African, ancient African system, is quoting this same book, ladies and gentlemen. And he's passing it off as if he done went to Africa and deciphered. The hieroglyphics or the well, meta. He's, he's been to Egypt a whole bunch of times. I, I, I know he has, but he's pretending that this right here has been deciphered from the original sources. No, no, you are like, feeding you black people this mess. Shame on you. Listen, this is there's nothing African about what he's showing them. But the whole audience and everyone who's watched this lecture are really thinking that they're getting closer to their indigenous culture. And he's showing them the other way. Mm, he's, he's taking them, he's getting them out of Africa, not into he, Africa. He, he's taking them further into the Caucasus Mountains. <laughs> Man, listen. <laughs> and this is what he says in this video. <laughs> right? If you watch the video, go to the three-minute mark, and he says, the light of the true African spiritual consciousness. That's what this is all about. True African spiritual consciousness. So we got to go through a transformation, a spiritual consciousness, which each of in order for us to be a people again. So the only way we could unite as Africans is if we become cosplayers in this mystical Egypt that's created by a bunch of Greek and Romans who couldn't read the actual script of actual <laughs> African ancestors. <laughs> Are you kidding me? This is violent, man. This is this is pretty Are bad. Are you kidding me? But here's the thing. He has initiated people into the system. Mm. A whole bunch of people. Because, again, he goes to Egypt, I don't know how many times a year, but he goes and people go. I think if you, if you go three, three trips, you study with him, you get initiated. One of the more famous initiates is... General Sarah Sutton Seti. Come on, man. <laughs> from his website. <laughs> this is a bio from his website. In 2003, General Seti made his first pilgrimage to Egypt under master teacher Ashwa Kwesi. General Seti went on to take two more trips in 2004 and 5 for a total of three years of after he was raised into the craft of Tahuti. The craft of Tahuti, man. The craft of Karen. <laughs> That's who he got raised up in. He got raised in the craft of raisins and potato salad. That's what he got raised into. Said I didn't go over there with no suit and ties. <laughs> <laughs> and this is this is problematic because for a lot of people, Seti, as crazy as he is, is the gateway drug into the conscious community. A lot of people's <laughs> first contact. With this information is through SETI. They love SETI. They love SETI. Oh my God, they love SETI. They love SETI. You know what I mean? It's, it's... So, most ironically, therefore, the quote Egyptian mystery system described by James is not African, mm -mm. but essentially Greek. And in, in its details, specifically European. James has, in effect, accused the Greeks of borrowing from themselves. <laughs> it said nothing about the real distinctively Egyptian ideas that influenced the Greeks during their long contact with each other. Right? So, it, I mean, 
it did happen. There's there, you know, when when two nations and coaches meet, there's going to be a cross pollinization, but not this. All right. The best evidence for the interchange of ideas between Greece and Egypt, of course, comes from the period after Alexander's conquest when Egypt was ruled by the Ptolemaic dynasty. So, ladies and gentlemen, when people tell you that Christianity is the white man's religion, you tell them, well, your Egyptian mystery system comes from the white man. <clears throat> right? It comes from the white man. The white man. Now, of course, as Christians, we don't care where the truth comes from. Yeah. We don't. You know, and, and just as a disclaimer, none of us, when we say that Christianity is not the white man's religion, what we are not saying is Christianity is the black man's religion. The gospel is for everyone. I'm just saying this because this is the accusation they like to throw at us. And what I'm showing them is that it's their hypocrisy. Because you're saying that these Greeks and Romans, these, you know, that it, it's derived from, you know, Christianity and all this is derived from these ancient mystery systems, which is supposed to be African. It's like, no, it's not. Your, your alleged mystery systems comes from Greco-Roman people who could not read the Metuneter. They couldn't read it. And even after they could read it, they split. You had the actual scholarly Egyptologists and you had the Egyptophists. Yeah, the blind, blind faithers. The, the ones who rather have the fantasy mm -hmm. than the reality. Right, so the next time you hear someone talking about these mystery systems, share this with them. Share this with them, because your whole belief system comes from the white man. It's not ancient, it's not old, and it's definitely not African. Mm -mm. So please stop it. So with that, sir, anything you'd like to share? Yeah, um, like I said, there are there are swaths of. Uh, of books like uh stolen legacy but you know I, I appreciate what uh what you did tonight because like i said you really got at the foundations uh of it and you know like i said if, if, if we're not trying to attack the person you know we're not trying to attack uh uh george james not trying to attack dr ben but Dr. Ben talked a lot of crap, man. <laughs> you know, if I wouldn't say if I say the other word, <laughs> but he talked a lot of stuff about Christianity. And he was talking hard in the paint. And anytime um, certain folks would challenge these dudes, they would, you know, try to play the race card. Well, look, you can't play the race card now. Because the very people who you appeal to also says that it's fiction. But um no I, like I said I appreciate it and and hopefully somebody and you know I don't expect um I don't expect everybody to swallow these uh what's the, these blue pills. Right. Right, right. <laughs> but um because it's tough. It's tough swallow. I mean people don't want to embrace Christianity. No. Especially when it's mis mischaracterized. That's true. But like I said, I appreciate what you did tonight. And, uh, you know, if uh, there were a lot of sources mentioned uh, that you brought up, uh, I showed the two sources. Uh, if you don't get no other, but get get the book Afrocentrism uh, by Stephen Howe. Also get uh, another book on Afrocentrism called uh, We Can't Go Home. Hold on for a second. Mm -hmm. We Can't Go Home Again, an argument about Afrocentrism by Clarence E. Walker. And it, too, pretty much talks about our, our man, George G.M. James, because, like I said, he, he is the pioneer for much of the uh, pseudo-scholarship that, um, you know, it's sad that he's a pioneer for that, but after him, the floodgates kind of opened. And, and, and it really did because they legitimized his work. Like in New York, in, in the origin of, of, of black studies, like in Hunter College in Manhattan, a lot of this was taught. Like Leonard, Professor Leonard Jeffries, Professor Small, like 
th this was actually taught in schools. In fact, um, the, the famous jazz um, musician, Sun Ra, he taught at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And in his syllabus was Stolen Legacy. He taught in Berkeley, bro. So this was in, it was in the university. You know, so of course, when you see stuff like that being legitimized, you, you tend to just take it as, as truth. And the reason why people like me and MJ and other people in your way go to such great lengths to do this, because we want people to rest assured that if you made Jesus Lord, you made the right decision. Mm -hmm. That most of these accusations, in fact, all these accusations against Christianity have no foundation. It's a house of cards. You know, it might be presented to you in a very compelling way. And you might be tempted to have your faith shaken. But if you do your due diligence and you do your research, you realize that nothing can stand next to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. We are Christians, not because it makes us feel good or it's the it's the American thing to do. We are Christians because it's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. And it best purports with reality. It is the only worldview that best purports with what's really real in this world. You know what I mean? That's why we do all this craziness. So that you can rest assured. It's like, you know what? When I made Jesus Lord, I, I was right. I was right. You know, because a lot of people, they're on their YouTube videos trying to convince you that your decision was wrong and that you should have doubt and you should rethink some things. We're saying, no, you don't have to look. Look. All right. You want indigenous black religion? You're in one already. <laughs> the Africans were there from day one. And we've been through all this, you know, we talked about King Exana and Aksum and Ethiopia. We we talked about that. Africans were there from day one. So you you want to embrace your blackness? Embrace the gospel. It's a, it's a two for one deal. Mm -hmm. It's a two for one deal. It's a, you know what I mean? So by the mid fourth century, east the east side of African was Christian. I was reading an article today that the Ethiopian the, the translations from from the, the 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 Greek into their language they were doing it almost ten years before the Greco Romans were doing it. So it's like, and again, I'm not saying Christianity is a black religion, but if you want quote unquote blackness, you want Africanness. Christian, the gospel, you know, the Africans, the, these, these, the actual comedic people that they were cosplaying, the actual comedic, when they heard the gospel, they repented and made Jesus Lord. Your ancestors, the slaves that were in America, knew the difference between the nonsense the slaveholder was, was preaching from the actual gospel. They knew the difference. Look at the slave narratives. Mm -hmm. They knew the difference. So let's give our ancestors some credit. They knew, but they actually did know better, and they told us. So again, the gospel still stands. That's the bottom line. If you get anything from this, the gospel still stands. It's still true. Jesus is still king. Taking on all comers. All day and knocking them out the box daily for the last 2,000 years. Okay? Undefeated out here. Mm -hmm. Right. So, MJ, any final thoughts before we out of here, sir? Jesus is king. If you still got breath in your body, repent and believe the gospel. Amen. And with that, we are out. Peace. <laughs>